place to visit in Ashland near the Sudbury River and Metcalf Mill, uh, where they would, uh, I think they uh, created the boxes for shoes, uh, cardboard boxes for shoes and everything. Um, but the main reason was they were able to, the officials were able to go through the train um, and do checkpoints along the way. They originally wanted to, the original thought, uh, mentioned this Evan in Lexington, was to replicate Paul Revere's ride was going to be the original course. But if you remember from your high school history, um, they didn't really want to start in Cambridge, roll the water, which I want to watch. Um, that's also about 25 miles. They would have to add a few extra miles and everything. So there's a few things that uh, um, stopped that. So in uh, Ashland, they had uh, 18 who signed up, 15 told the line, and 10 men finished. Uh, and Tom Burke, the BAA, dug a, a line to the heel of the shoe uh, at 12, 19 p.m. Basically said, go, and they all went. Um, and that's how, in 1897, the first Boston Marathon was held. Um, this is the original starting line on Pleasant Street, a uh, different version, a different angle, a photo of it. Um, Ashland still holds some races here. There's the Sudbury River from the previous photo. Metcalf Mill was burned down in the 30s. It's no longer there. Um, but what the town has done, they have these informational plaques, and these it's called Marathon Park right here. Um, it's a nice area to visit, and the actual starting line is right here. And if you look closely, it's Bill Rogers in black singlet uh, towards the starting line there. Uh, he ran this year's race, the, the year of the photo. Uh, but you can go visit this place. It's really nice, the Marathon Park in Ashland. And the previous uh, photo that I showed you of the painting is, is uh, located right on the edge of this park. So it's a great place to go visit. So 1897 and 1898, Boston Marathon started right here on Pleasant Street. And then for the third year, the BAA had created their clubhouse in Boston. So they thought, well, the first two years finished on the Irvington Street Lowell Oval, uh, track oval uh, behind the Boston Public Library. It's no longer there now. But then the BAA uh, built their clubhouse. So they wanted the marathon to finish at their clubhouse. So to do that, they had to change the starting line. So what they did is had to remember it. And for the next uh, eight or nine years, the starting line was back here. There's a bridge that goes over the train tracks. It goes over Amtrak uh, right over here. So for the next seven, eight years, seven or nine years, that's where the start of the Boston Marathon was. And then one year, there's 105 entrants on the bridge. God, that's a lot of entrance. So they said, we can't have that. We have to move it to a larger river. So the final starting line in Ashland, they moved it to where the current four kilometer mark is. So if you are running Boston Marathon and you drive Route 135 at all, the current four kilometer mark, there used to be a farmland there, uh, the senior center, I think is down by the corner, State Park area, the four kilometer mark was the last of the three starts from Ashland um, up the Boston Marathon. So you can actually trace over that. Um, and obviously over the years, we have now 30,000 runners from 15 runners the first year to about 30,000. You need huge expos to accommodate everyone. Um, in 1996, the 100, that was the first year that they had a three day expo, which is what we do now to sort of welcome everybody. Um, and part of Marathon Weekend, or kind of Marathon Week, Marathon Month, is um, the BAA and John Hancock bring back a lot of the previous champions at press conferences and media conferences. Some of them helped with Dana Barber, like Jack Cole, who won in 1976. Um, I've run, in addition to having run Boston 23 times. I've run 20 other marathons in different states and countries. And uh, just from experience, Boston does it like this. Not too many, the New York does it a little bit like this, but not as long as we have. Boston really does a great job bringing back the history. Um, but this row right here, Uta Pivik, who won Boston three times in Germany. Um, Shalane Flanagan, who had won Boston a number of times, one of our great uh, US Olympians, medalist. Ryan Hall, set the record as an American marathoner. I had run Boston a number of times. Um, Becca Pizzi, who the first American female who ran the um, seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. She had done that. Um, st still an excellent runner. Uh, Joan Bryce Samuelson, two-time Boston winner who won the inaugural women's Olympic marathon in 1984. Good old Boston Billy Rogers, who's won Boston four times, New York four times an Olympian. Another Olympic, uh, Olympian from uh, the US, Gina Castor, um, who has a, a medal as well. She's won Boston a couple of times. 
Uh, Matt Kukleski, uh, last American so far, the 2014 male uh, winner, and Greg Meyer, who won Boston in 1983. So it's nice to see all these uh, legends coming back. That's just what Boston is. Now, as far as weather, those of you who may have run this in 2018 right now, probably, I apologize for the flashback. <laughs> um, Boston in April is, we know in New England, we've had, for the marathon, we've had snow, sheets of rain, as you can see, we've had an eclipse, we've had um, dense fog, we've had tremendous heat. Um, we actually had a volcano in Iceland that affected 500 runners who couldn't attend. Uh, I remember Dave McGilvey, the race director, was saying, I have to worry about a volcano halfway around the world. But that's part of what Boston is. Um, this is in Framingham area. You can see the sheets of rain. This is about six mile long. And, and they look like they've already run the marathon. Um, so you can just tell weather wise uh, what can happen. Uh, this one from 2012, this is the real hot, hot year, one of the many. Um, but this was so hot at the BAA, because we knew the heat was coming all week. The BAA actually said to the official entrance, you can defer to the next year if you'd like, if you don't think you've well uh, trained enough for the heat. Um, this is Natick Fire Department right here, Natick Center. Uh, I did run this one. This is the last of my 23 that I had run. Um, when I went through Wellesley, it was 91 degrees on the bank, high temperature thing, which I didn't really even know. <laughs> um, but I found this interesting. This is one of those hazmat tents that the fire department uses to wash themselves off after uh, a fire. And they usually have the hose anyway for the runners, but this year in particular, in 2012, they had this. So I thought I'd take a picture because this is around the time I was writing one of the Boston Marathon books. So I had the uh, camera in my panic bag. But as I stood here to take a couple of these photos, I noticed nobody was running by me until I looked and what runners would do because it was so hot and the water would evaporate. They ran through a couple of times and they would circle through, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. It was just that hot of the day, which you really have to uh, keep an eye on your, your hydration and go re real slow um, if possible. Uh, this is just a dense fog I was telling you about. Um, that's happened a number of years. Um, this also affects TV coverage too, which you may not think of, because you have the cameras on the ground and the satellite bounced off the helicopter and goes into the studio. Well, when helicopters are grounded because of the dense fog, you don't get that um, viewership, the, the, uh, the cameras for the viewers to see. So on years like this, when the helicopters couldn't fly, you could make aerial um, angles or a satellite to bounce off to get any other uh, angles like that. Just the people who were on the ground with their cameras. So Channel 4, for example, will just have a few people on the course with their, cam with their you know, cameras recording. That's all you would get until helicopters could go up. So the coverage was a little limited. Uh, but you can see how thick this is. This is in, in Hawkington. So the weather has been interesting uh, throughout the years, as, as you might expect for an event uh, this lasted this long. Uh, this is back to uh, Hawkington, as I just showed you in the dense fog from a different year. Um, this is Hawkington High School, middle school field where the athletes' village is, where all the runners congregate. And then seven tenths of a mile from this is the starting line where your runners are escorted up um, per their corral, per their seating and everything. Um, there's a tent here that can have um, calisthenics, get you in there for two, three, four hours sometimes, plenty of Porter Johns, tents for protection. Um, one year, 1996, for the hundreds, if you recall being around here, it snowed a couple of days before uh, the marathon. So the grass was all covered with snow. So Dave McGilvey, the race director, had to stay quick with it. So he got rid of the snow as best he could. And then he had two army helicopters hovering about 100 feet above the grass to sort of dry the grass. Um, and then he put sawdust and some straw on it. It did work. It was still a little muddy, especially in the back behind the American flag there. But I always joke with Dave. I said, I hope you told the neighbors that you're going to have two army helicopters. Which are allowed when they fly by anyway. You can imagine 100 feet, it's only 10 stories up. Um, that must have been nice looking out the kitchen window. <laughs> um, this is Hopkinton Center, where it all starts. And this street right here, where these white homes, uh, um, homes are, is Hayden Row. And from 1965 to 1985, uh, more to that generation of, of uh, recollections of winners. And the starting line is actually on Hayden Row. 
So the gun would go off at noon, all the runners would run straight ahead and, that, and it couldn't write out the main street for 20 years. <laughs> so they stopped that um, after 85. So now, as we all know, I'm watching that TV or running, you start on Main Street and you go straight ahead. But for a time, you get to start on a side street and then go uh, to Main Street. And also on the corner of this is roughly where Bobby Gibb jumped in 1966 to become the first woman finisher of the Boston Marathon. Um, because during that time, the Amateur Athletic Union, which was the governing body of the Boston Marathon and, and all races um, that the AAU um, uh, were the governing body of, did not allow women to run that distance. It wasn't the race itself, it was the AAU. So in 1966, when Bobby did ran this, she, did, she jumped in around that corner. And there's going to be a statue there that she created, she's also a sculptor, that they dedicated in the fall. Um, and their plan was to permanently uh, put, uh, install it around that corner. I'm not sure if they have done that yet. I think they're waiting for the weather to clear up nicely. Um, there's also two sidewalks that intersect behind the bandstand called Johnny Kelly Crossing. Um, there's a number of things to see here, uh, tourism wise. Across the street from this, in front of the church, there's a Korean plaque of all the uh, world record holders and winners, uh, Korean uh, runners for the Boston Marathon. And this year, um, that I took this, I think this is 2004, 2005. Uh, Frank Shorter was resting. He was running for Channel 5, I think. He had a microphone, he was going to give reports while he was running. Frank Shorter basically started the running boom. Uh, he won the Olympic gold medal 1972 marathon in Munich, Germany. Uh, he won the silver medal marathon in 1976. He's won ballot a couple of times. Um, he basically started, kickstarted, because after 1972, you had Bill Rogers winning Boston in 1975. You had Title IX in 1972. You had a lot of road races start coming up. So a lot of things added together. Jim Hicks' book about running. So you had a lot of things that, that started in the early 70s. And Frank was a, a big part of it too. And it was funny, I showed him this photo once um, at the Federal Road Race Expo where he was next to Captain Durango, one of my great uh, marathoners, and Bill Rogers and, and uh, some others. And he's looking at this photo and he say, hey, look, I'm, I'm lying down. I'm actually doing what I tell people to do, what you're supposed to do as a marathon. And everyone looked at him like, you're Frank Shaw, of course you're going to do that. But it's just kind of funny. He goes, look, I'm actually doing what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and not everyone knows what they tell people. This is to the left of where Frank Shorter was in the previous photo um, in Ashland. This is one in uh, Huffington. One Ash Street is the BAA, um, um, one of their headquarters here. And if you look closely, this little yellow image right here in the window is actually a unicorn, which is the uh, the logo of the Boston Athletic Association. The closer you get to the Boston Marathon, this unicorn gets closer and closer until it fills the entire window. So on marathon morning, you'll see it fill the entire window. So it's a nice, nice little thing that nobody talks about, but some neat little thing that the VA does it's on their own. Uh, marathon Way is the little roadway. The little triangle at the starting line that you see where the staging is. Um, and this is Ash Street right here that goes down to the school where the Team Hoyt um, statue is of Rick and Dick Hoyt. Uh, the father of Dick had just passed away uh, recently. Um, the reason the statue is on Ash Street down in front of the school is that when you see this on TV, when you see the math on TV, the wheelchair athletes line up on Ash Street down close to the school. In, a, in sort of grid based on their seating. And then when it's time for them to start, they um, are escorted up to the starting line and remain in that grid. And behind that grid was the coin. So they always spent their time down there. So they thought it'd be out of the front of the school. It's a beautiful statue uh, of the two of them. And I remember talking to Dick about the, uh, the statue, the sculptor, I think, was in Texas. And he would FaceTime back and forth to get progress. And Dick would be looking at photos of his head. And he goes, my, my head's not that big because it's too big. And the sculptor goes, oh, no way about it. It's a statue and all fit in. Um, Cause I was talking to Dick, I said, if you think about it, you, you, don't, you, you can't see your own head three dimensional ever. Even in the mirror, you can't. So for him to see his, the head, he goes, it's okay, it's a statue. It'll fit the portrait. So it did, it's a beautiful statue. And George Brown with the starting gun as a starter, uh, statue, which is a, other than a couple of exceptions, has been a Brown family member starting the Boston Marathon um, since its beginning. And the Brown family is very entrenched in Boston 
sports history with the Boston Arena, the Boston Celtics, uh, the BAA. Uh, the Brown family has been real integral in that. The post office in Hopkins is named after one of the Brown family members. Um, so they're really important to the history of this race. Uh, and the starting line, which we love. Um, I do love this picture on Marathon Weekend. Police will stop the traffic for you if you want to picture taken with it. And like I said before, Boston does so many neat things, nice personal touches. Um, all the cities and the BAA, everyone does great things. And I can tell you, if you try to do this in, you know, for the Chicago Marathon in New York, you're not going to make it <laughs> across the city. Um, but they'll stop traffic for you. For any kind of a line. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. And the cars wait because they, they get it. They understand. Um, and the line itself is painted, was painted by Jack Rupert, um for decades. Um, his family has taken over and retired from painting it. Um, but each year he would do something different to the starting line as a surprise. And usually re reflected some theme of that year. Uh, the first year they had the wait stops because Boston used to be at noon going off. Everyone went, man, woman, down. Then they had wave starts, you know, a thousand runners every minute in, in, a, in a wave uh, process. So, what he did is he painted waves on the starting line. Um, one year when Johnny Kelly, the elder, there's two Johnny Kellys. Johnny Kelly, uh, the younger, we call him, he won Boston in 1957 out of Connecticut. Johnny Kelly, the elder, he's won Boston in 1935 and 1945. So, we always say the younger and the elder to differentiate it. They're unrelated. Um, when Johnny Kelly died, they had a nice little um, silhouette of him here um, to recognize his passing. Um, the year I took this, if you see here, there's a little EKG cardiogram line here with Dave McGilvery's initials as the year he had a bypass. Uh, Dave McGilvery, the race director, as some of you may know, uh, it will be running his 50th Boston Marathon this year. He runs after everybody else. Um, so once everyone goes through, once the race is, you know, taken hold, doing well, he goes back to Hopkinton somewhere in mid-afternoon with some state troopers and he'll run the entire race and finish 10, 11 p.m., um, depending on what he starts. So there's always something usually is his initials in the year he, the year of which he's running. This being the 50th, I'm going to imagine is going to be some sort of logo here with Dave McGilvery and the number 50. Um, I'm only guessing, but uh, I'm assuming. Um, this is the old days, recent old days, I'll say, <laughs> of the start of the Boston Marathon, where we just filled Main Street from curb to curb. And like I said, at 12 o'clock, gun went off, everyone went off. This is before um, the bid numbers here, but this is before, this might be with a chip number, I can't recall the year of this one. Um, but for the most part, when it started at noon, we didn't have chip numbers. So if you're way back here, and the gun goes off at noon, and it takes you 12 minutes to get to the starting line, you're 12 minutes into your start. You know, even if you just <laughs> start your clock and starting line, you're 12 minutes in um, because there's no chip technology for the longest time. Even when I, 1990 was the first year I ran it. You know, 1996 was the first year of the chip when they had a 38,000 run for the hunt. So even I remember my lifetime, no chip. But what the BA did, which was neat, sometime after the race, you get a little index card from them in the mail. To deduct a certain amount of minutes based on what they thought it would take you to get there. So that was pretty good. I wish you still did that. <laughs> That'd be kind of fun. Um, so you fill the whole street, but then what would happen is that there'd be a natural bottleneck at the start because it's wider here than it is at the actual starting line top of the hill. So if the gun would go off and you, you wouldn't even be moving, and the clock would be ticking. Um, so to solve that, Dave McGilvery, what he did was he measured the, the starting area. The widest part of Main Street is 89 feet, and the most narrow is 39 feet. At, obviously, in the starting line, there's your bottom there. So what he did was he measured 25 feet and set up police fencing that you see now. So it's uniformly 25 feet all the way down. And I remember the first year that happened, I was running, and I go, well, now I'm going to be farther back because they're shrinking the width of the road. Thinking to myself, but because it was 25 feet from the start all the way to the end, you went quickly. It was very efficient. He still does that. I figured since I was farther back, it would take longer, but no, because it was uniformly 25 feet, everybody went. Um, it just looks like a great thought because it filled the whole street. <laughs> now, at the, at the one mile mark, you have this statue here, uh, the spirit of the marathon. 
Um, as you're running them, you may not see it because you're paying attention to your running. You don't want to get hit by somebody, get a flat tire or fall down. So, but it's, this statue is here permanently at the, the nursery here. Um, Stiliano Kiriakidis, right here, was the great runner who won Boston in 1946. A real good runner, too. Um, basically, our first charity runner because Greece in 1946 was just coming out of a war and the country was just decimated. And uh, Stelios used this opportunity from winning the Boston Marathon to bring attention to that. And he went home with literal, literally shiploads of supplies in Greece. The support he received, uh, the awareness that Greece was in trouble and needed help uh, was thanks to him, basically our first charity run. So look at it that way. Um, the story of the statue is very interesting and very long, so I won't get into too much of it. Uh, it's a beautiful statue here. Um, Stelios' uh, son, Dimitri, uh, spearheaded it. There's an identical one in Greece near the original marathon. And they were going to dedicate it when the Olympics were in uh, Athens in 2004 um, with just Stelios Kyriakidis right here. So the mayor of uh, part of the marathon agreed to it, but then after a while, changed, the, changed their mind. So then they changed the position of the statue along the course. And the, the next mayor said, well, you can put it there, but you're going to have um, Spiridon Louis, the fellow Greek who won the original in, in 1896 marathon. And the sculptor was like, you know, it's not like a painting, right? It's painting on somebody. It's, it's, it takes a long time to create the sculpture. So he thought about it, thought about it. And what he ended up doing, smartly, actually very clever, is he created another body of Spiridon Louis, basically attached it to the side of Stelios. And if you notice, Spirit of Louis' feet don't touch the ground of the statue. So there's your spirit of the marathon, and Stelios is running the spirit of Spirit of Louis alongside. So there's your spirit of the marathon title. And that's how we solve the problem. It's basically attached to another full body of the statue. The beautiful statue, very tall, very detailed. If you get a chance to see it, it's worth the trip. Uh, now we're in Ashland. Um, Great bar here. These guys and gals are here for hours and hours earlier, taking in libation and uh, heavy metal music at nine in the morning, eight in the morning, seven in the morning. <laughs> they really get you going. They're a great supporter. Um, as you see at the beginning, how downhill it is. And if you ever run a marathon or a longer race, you're always told don't go off fast, uh, Boston especially, and see how downhill it is. Um, in 1987, 88, um, this road was just recently paved and it was kind of misty out, so it's sort of slick. And if you remember the old black and white photos of wheelchair athletes falling over, um, back then the wheelchairs were upright more, more of a hospital wheelchair, not the real nice aerodynamic ones nowadays. And what happened was when the gun went off for the wheelchair athletes, uh, they came down this road and, and it was so slick that they crashed, some crashed into each other, some fell off into the grass, they picked themselves up. Um, they didn't care themselves, they were athletes as part of it. But it just wasn't good, you know, you don't want anyone to get injured. Ten minutes later, the same year, the rest of the field went up. You know, noon time, gun went up, man born a child. At the time, they had a rope in front of all those entrants, you know, volunteer at each end. And as the countdown came, the volunteer would drop the rope and then scoots the rope out to get the rope out of the runner's way. Well, for that particular year, part of the rope was still there, and when the gun went up, a lot of runners tripped over that rope. And fell and stumbled upon each other. Same year as the wheelchair accident. So Dave McGilvey was tasked to fix it. <laughs> so the following year, when he did two smart things of me, for the wheelchair athletes, he paced them down to where it gets flat. There's a flat area here, and there's a line painted. So what he did is he basically controlled the start of the wheelchair athletes. So when gun went off the wheelchair athletes, they'd stay in place of their seating. They go down the hill, once it's flattened off here, they knew where it was, then they could race. So you control that down there and solve that problem. And for the uh, runners, what they what he did was instead of having a rope, he still does this. Um, he had volunteers shoulder to shoulder in front of all the runners. So then when the countdown came, instead of the rope, just the volunteers would go to the sidewalk. And that opened up the road, the runners went. So Dave always joked that because of that, he got the job as racer. <laughs> Um, but it worked, especially to get that race off, especially with so, so many runners. Um, I'll take you through each town, Framingham here briefly. 
uh, eight kilometer mark, five miles up there. So the road is much wider, so he kind of get a, a better pace um, early in the race. Um, this is the Framingham train station. The train, the new rail comes right up here. There are tracks that go across the course underneath the satellites. Um, so you got to be careful for running such a rain that can be really slick. Um, one of the real early races, Thomas Longboat uh, won this. Um, they kept hearing the train's horn, which happened a lot every year. They, the trains would do the horn to cheer you on as you run, because for a good portion of the course, the tracks parallel the course. But they kept hearing it louder and louder, it wasn't really slowing down. So Thomas Longboat, with five other runners, sort of picked it up and ran past the crust right here, just in time that they turned behind them and the train cut right across the course. And all the other runners had to wait. So you had six runners on one side of the train and all the other runners, this is turn of the century, 1908-ish, 19 teens. Um, so it wasn't that many runners, but still, you get the train for about a minute. The first six runners were like, <laughs> they just kept going. Um, and then once the train cleared, all the other runners could go. Um, obviously, uh, unplanned. I joked with Dave McGilvey, who can maybe you check the train schedule. He goes, that will not happen. Because <laughs> it's still a commuter wheel. It's, it's, it's out of the tracks. Um, entering native now, I guess I'm in, in, a lot of inclines coming up. But I kind of always, I like, I enjoy putting this water away. I don't know if it's in the wind thing or not. But you know, when one town does their paving and then they stop at the next town. <laughs> Just look at, like, you know, Framingham's like, we're going to the right way here. You know, the shoulder's different. The, Colors down. I just get a kick out of it because I run out of marathon that we see this so defined. I don't know, it's kind of funny. Maybe it's a doing the thing. Um, but you can see little inclines which you know you don't expect uh, so early in the race, but your 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 training and your momentum as a runner should take care of it, no problem. Still a native here, this the lake here. Um, legend has it in the 30s that Tarzan Brown, one of my great runners, on such a hot marathon. Jumped in the water, cooled off, jumped back on, and, and finished. Uh, what he actually did was because the roll was configured a little different. There was no ground rail back then. Uh, the road was a little more angled. He went in the water, he took his shoes off, and cooled off his feet. Because um, as you know, the heat can expand your feet uh, and get blisters and stuff. So I kind of like the first story that I saw. I include both. <laughs> um, and also, since the 60s, with very few exceptions, have been a Red Sox team going to the marathon. Um, when the marathon started at noon, and the game is like I think at 10, 10 30, uh, the game will usually be over about time wise, about the time the leaders start to look at Kenmore Square. So you get 20, 30 Red Sox fans coming out at the Kenmore Square. Um, now there's what, 12, 10 or 12 starts between 9 and 11 30 ish, somewhere around there. So the time is a little off, but the still game is great. And throughout the course, you'll get the updates. So if you're a Sox fan, local Sox fan, great. Your kids on the radio, they'll yell out scores. Um, I remember a couple of years, I, I run by myself, but I'll, you come up with people from different states and different parts of the world that you just chat with as you're running. Had no idea what a Sox was. <laughs> I had to explain, well, it's the Boston Red Sox and the Seattle Mariners, and they're like, what? I'm like, it's a sport, baseball. What's an inning? So it's just kind of funny trying to explain baseball to somebody. Um, I have no idea what it is. But, it helped us along the way. This is Native Center. Uh, this area is a little different, a little more construction uh, has been done since I took this photo. Uh, this, these years, you can, you can hear the uh, American flag flap over the uh, region of the windy and windy day. And there was an opening here, this little space that there used to be a flatbed. Uh, I don't know if he still does this. And there was this gentleman who, who would sing all day, standing on the flatbed, great voice, microphone. He had like the you know, Neil Diamond Elvis shirt with open chest and swinging his, his head, singing all these great songs. Great voice, it would, it would perk you up. This is about 10 miles. So it was really neat to hear him. He had a really nice voice. So I'm sure as a spectator here, you hear him sing all day. Pretty good. Um, the road gets a little narrow here, which is neat. The town common kind of comes out. So it really pulls you in if you need support about here. Again, this is about 10 miles in the center of Natick. Um, this is also a native just beyond the center of town. There was a resident here, I don't think lives here anymore, was an engineer. And he would build something different each year 
on a flatbed where you had, you, had, you know, neighbor and stuff sitting on to cheer us on. This year, the uh, green monster from Fenway, you know, Coca-Cola and the foul pole. Uh, but it's like a flatbed truck here, and the people will be sitting on watching, cheering us on in the barbecue. Um, can't go anywhere. <laughs> they closed down the street. Uh, one year when the Zaker Bridge was built, he made a Zaker Bridge. That was about this size. It was really neat. One year he built a, um, it looked like a dollhouse. It was, it was basically replicated this house with no front. So it was like a dollhouse, three story dollhouse with no front, and they were sitting on the floors and the ceiling cheering us on. It's just like if you opened up a whole dollhouse, and that's what it was. Um, it was really fun to see. Some look forward to when you're running that distance, too. Um, again, also in Natick, uh, Santa Claus has been there for decades. This is 2012. So he doesn't have a jacket on for the hood. I'm still surprised he did this. The beard is real, so he couldn't take that off. Um, I was telling someone earlier when I first ran this in 1990, um, when you when you run up this hill, I, I wear a hat, and you, when you run up a hill, you sort of lean forward a little bit. So as I'm running up this hill, up, he was closer to the edge. I'm seeing this guy with these black shiny shoes with a white collar, uh, red long pants. I'm going. And I look up and he had a jacket on and Santa. And I'm going, I'm in trouble. This is about maybe 11, 12 miles. I'm hallucinating Santa Claus in April. I'm not good. And he's going, You boys and girls have been good this year. So I told my friends who had also run that year. And no one had seen Santa. They must have come up from the other side. There's a lot more people two blocks away. So the next year, next uh, year that I ran in 91, I had my little camera with fanny back. Well, I'm going to take a picture of Santa or, or nothing. So sure enough, there he was, Santa's like came up on the sidewalk. I go ahead and take a picture. He goes, Oh, sure. And from behind him, you can't really see it here, but from behind him, there's this little guy dressed in green with a hat with a little bell on the end, and he has the shoes hooked up with the bell, dressed as an elf. And I'm going, Oh, wow, I'm really in trouble two years in a row. And he goes, Hey, I'll take a picture for you. I'm like, Oh, good, you're real. <laughs> so he took a picture of me with Santa, and I showed my friends so they you know for that reason. But he's done that every year. It's great. I think he missed one year. Um, but to see Santa there telling us we're all good, uh, you need that. <laughs> support is support. Uh, entering Wellesley, Wellesley College campus is right around here. Um, I love seeing this sign here that you see everywhere. Uh, again, this is another thing that Boston does. They don't have to do that DPW for no parking. They don't have to put a runner break in the line. They could just put the normal board signs. That's another thing that Boston does. It really makes this special, unique, um, and they're everywhere on the side. But it's neat seeing those sides. But Wellesley is the, roughly the halfway point. 13 miles is here, Wellesley College at Mungar Hall, and the famous screen tunnel. Uh, these women are amazing. Uh, they've done this every year but one. Uh, one year, the marathon fell on uh, Easter week. Um, the, uh, the early decade of the marathon was held on April 19th, regardless of the day of the week. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if the 19th was then, that's when the marathon was, with the exception of it, if it fell on a Sunday, then they wouldn't have it on Sunday. Uh, it wasn't until late 60 they changed it to the third Monday in April. Um, so one year it fell on Easter break and they went there. Um, but since the beginning, the first year, the Wellesley College women knew one of the runners in the first year in 1897 from Harvard. And they went out the chair that came on, and they've been here ever since. And it's a screen tunnel. Uh, because you had runners, uh, people cheering on both sides of the road here. There's no fencing, so they could really close in on you. You know, much like you can see the uh, Tour de France of cyclists and the camera from the viewpoint of the cyclists, and there's like people who could sort of spread their spread the way as you go. That's how this was. I mean, some of the Bill Rogers photos of him running, he could reach out and touch the spectators as he's running. There's no no crowd support. This is 1983, I think. Um, in 1996, they started putting up fencing because it was 38,000 runners. Um, so you couldn't be on this side. The train tracks are on this side. Um, and especially since the bombing, they're real stringent on who's on the course itself. So no one can go on this side of the course. So it's technically not a screen tunnel in the fact that there's people on both sides, but they make up for it. You can hear them before you see them. Um, I've come up to people running and they wonder if that's the train that they're hearing because the train is still uh, parallel here. I said, no, that's several hundred women cheering and yelling, you'll see them in the And they're here, so 
for several blocks, and you can hear it as you go past them. It's about 13 miles, halfway points in the center of them. Um, but they're amazing. And they also have um, what they started maybe 10, 12 years ago on Facebook or social media is you can contact them. They're doing this right now. Um, you can contact them for you for them to put a sign up. So say you live in Australia, you know, and your friend Anton is running it, and you want to say, go Anton, great job, but you can't make it to cheer them on. You let them know they will create a sign and they'll put it on the fence in you. What a great surprise. And they're doing it now a week or two before the marathon when they're actually creating them. I just read um, that's what they're doing now right now. They spread out all these poster boards and stuff and they're actually making the signs right now for that. So it's kind of a neat thing that they do. Um, so not all the signs of people who are there. It's like, you know, mom and dad can send something from a different part of the country, the world actually. Um, entering Newton here, this is uh, Route 128.95, just around the corner here. Um, the Pillar House used to be right around here, if you're familiar with the area at all. Uh, first real downhill actually coming down here into Newton Falls and Lower Falls um, to go over 128.95. So you starting the first 13, 14 miles are basically the same, you know, as a runner. Um, we were, and when you watch this on TV, you see the big clusters of runners. They don't really separate until after 128.95 because you know, the big athletes are in such great shape, but there's no real test yet for, for the elite runners. Um, the race is first downhill that people forget about. Uh, Coach Bill Squire is telling me uh, he coached the Greater Boston Track Club. Which started in 1973 at Boston College. And uh, he coached basically all the American winners of the Boston Marathon in the 70s and 80s came from the Great Boston Track Club, and who he coached. Uh, Bill Rogers, Alberto Salazar, Greg Meyer, uh, Bob Hall, the wheelchair uh, athlete, um, who all won Boston, came out of Great Boston Track Club. John Fultz, who won in 76, wasn't a Great Boston member then, but he was coached by a coach later on. Uh, a lot of top runners, Bob Hodge, Rain Thomas, uh, Dick Mahoney, all these guys that are top 10 came out of Great Boston Track Club. So what Bill Squires did one day, he wanted to show his runners, don't run in the middle, you know, try to go the least resistance or cut a tangent is what they call it. So when you're running, instead of going on a turn like a truck really wide, go close to the corner here. You're cutting a tangent, it's the least uh, distance. So at the top of this hill behind me, he had a tennis ball with his guys on a Sunday morning, put the tennis ball down and said, follow that tennis ball, get that visual in your head. So the tennis ball went down the least resistance. Then tennis ball didn't go in the middle. You know, it went either on the side or depending on where it was on the hill, it would go towards the end, the edges of it. So he used that as a trick. Everyone does that now. A lot of things everyone does now, you, they just started to do it in the 70s. You know, like the Kenyans who reign as a group past few decades, Pushed each other. Well, that's what the Americans are doing in the 70s. It's great awesome. They train together like that. They're all 210, 212 marathons, 214s. They train together, and then when they race together, it would be one of their days. Someone had their day and did it. You know, they wanted to beat each other, but someone would filter out. Um, and it was training like this that would help. Uh, going through the course like that, they did all their training, most of their training on the course for Boston College. Um, this being Newton, 19.1 mile mark, is caught out part of the course. It goes up here. Uh, John and Kelly statue. Um, when this statue is first dedicated, it's actually dedicated up here. Um, but a few months later, someone drove into it and broke his arm. So they repaired it and they figured we're not going to put it up there. Uh, it reminds me of with the um, most marathons have a blue line that goes the middle of the course, the entire course. We don't, we have a blue line. For about a mile to start and finish because of the bombings to uh, honor the police officers and those who passed away. But we didn't have a blue line that goes the entire course. I remember asking uh, David Gilbert why we don't have that. And he's like, oh, we have drivers that don't know what to do with the yellow and white line. So I put a blue line in the middle of the road. I'm like, well, that's true. Someone hit the statue, so I get it. <laughs> Good point. Um, so Johnny Kelly is the, this is a terrific statue. It's uh it's it's Johnny Kelly holding hands with himself from the 1935 win to when he was running in the 90s. Um, so it's a nice connection of his, of his span of life. Um, this is also about a mile before Heartbreak Hill. Heartbreak Hill is about 20 and a half miles. Uh, in 1935, Johnny Kelly won his first of two Boston Marathons. 
So he was favored in 1936. So in 1936, everyone was all their eyes were on Johnny. And around this area here, he was behind Tarzan and Brown, again, one of our great marathons. So about 20 or so, 20 and a half miles, John finally caught up to Tarzan and sort of tapped him on the back, like kind of like I, I got it now, which sort of woke up Tarzan, who just took off on a second win. Uh, ended up winning that year, and Johnny came in fifth in 1936. And Jerry Nason, who was the sports editor of the Globe, um, saw that and he commented in his reporting of it that that move broke Johnny's heart and it morphed into Heartbreak Hill. Uh, it's a tough spot uh, right up here, but there's enough flat areas between each hill that uh, you can do. The hills themselves aren't bad, it's just where they are. You can train on the hills all the time and have no problem, but after running 17, 18, 19 miles, those hills, they'll work on it. Um, and this is the top of Heartbreak Hill in Mile 21. When you see the Gothic towers of Gaston Hall from Boston College, you know you're almost at the top of the Hill. Uh, it's a beautiful sight, <laughs> whether you're a Jesuit or not. Um, so at 21 miles, you only have five miles to go, but the toughest part, I sort of hesitate to say, but the toughest part is behind you in that the hill divide. Um, Bacon Street, even though you only have five miles to go, Bacon Street still has some tough areas to get to them. Um, the medical tent here that Bill Rogers sort of half jokes that that's his favorite place to drop out, which he has. He dropped out his first year, he dropped out in 2008, 2009. He's sort of half joking. Um, if you see an elite athlete, one of the leaders drop out of a race around 20, 21, 22 miles, and they're not injured, that's normal because elite athletes can only do really two marathons a year one in the spring, one in the fall. At, you can run more than that, but top speed, you know, uh, that's really what you want too. So, and then get paid in addition, uh, there's placing in the map for a second, third, fourth, all the way down. So, if they, if they get a run here with four or five miles to go and it's just not my day, I'm really out of the prize money, I don't want to push myself, they'll stop around here at any marathon to save themselves to do another marathon in the spring. And this is just a training run for them. Kind of odd, I have to say. Um, but for them, a 21, 22, 23 miles could be a training run. They save themselves and they can get into another spring marathon where they push themselves hard, but out of the money, didn't feel good, they're done for the spring. They really can't find another one. So he was half joking when he said that. Um, you know, that's just the area. Uh, also, now entering Brighton, this is on the other side of the hill. Boston College is right here. This is more Hall, which is different now that we've done it. Um, the train tracks, the green lines on this side. This is a deceptively difficult area. Um, 22 mile mark is right around the corner of Evergreen Cemetery, right beyond that. You only have four miles to go. Uh, I say only because in your training, you're, you're, you're doing much more. But this is a tough spot. It can get cold, it can get windy, it can get really hot. It's a, it's a tough spot. You've done all the hard hills, so you think, oh, I'm done with all the tough parts, and you still got several miles to go, so don't get too ahead of yourself. Um, this is also the area where some of the leaders have been decided. You'll get some lead changes, some leaders who just stopped here because they, they just couldn't deal with it anymore. It's a tough spot, because on the other side of this hill, you go down to Chester Hill Ave, you take a left up the Cleveland Circle. Um, and then that gets you into Beacon Street, which is straight into the finish line area. So it can be deceptive, but if you, if you get a handle on it, you should be okay. Uh, this is Beacon Street, 23 miles, you only have three to go, 5K to go in Brookline. Um, to give you an idea of how hilly Beacon Street can be, which people forget, is here we got 23 mile mark with three miles to go, so high up on the course, you can see the skyline. There's the finish line. There's the credential and there's the handcuff. This tells you, shows you how high you are, even on a bigger street, which I always never really got into when I, again, I was where I had and I didn't really focused up far ahead. And again, I remember David Gilby telling me once, because you know, you can see the skyline from Beacon. I'm like, no, you can't. It's, you go down after Heartbreak Hill, then you go down to Cleveland Circle, you don't go up again. And he goes, yeah. Take a look once in a while. So I did my year and I took this picture. I'm like, you can see the skyline. <laughs> and 
and it's good and bad. It's good that that's my goal is sort of growing. Like it's bad that I'm this far up that I can see it. So I know I'm going to go down. And it can really work on your legs. It gives a few undulating hills, one up and down beacon. Um, this also be a Brookline reminds me of a funny story. I did a story of the um, the Greek wreaths that the winners get presented on their head at the finish. Well, it comes from Greece. And they create it and they bring it over here, a nice ceremony. And the governor and mayor presented it. Well, Governor Dukakis, for a number of years, had that honor to present it, him being a Greek American. So I interviewed him. He's at works at Northeastern University, teaching there. And he was telling the story about the wreath. And he ran this as a kid in high school. Um, he's from Brookline, and he ran in high school three hours and 31 minutes. He did a good job. I think he was 17 at the time. And his wife, Kitty, who wasn't his wife at the time, would tell him that she gave him water right around here. And he goes, I can't, I can't remember getting water. And I go, did she? And he said, Paul, if Kitty says she gave me water, she gave me water. <laughs> she got better memory than me. She's my wife, so she's like, um, so right away, I always think of uh, Mike Dukakis, one of us, Governor Dukakis. He did a great job, 331. Not bad at all. Now this, I put this photo in uh, just for one reason. Uh, it's just a bunch of signs. This is about less than a mile, maybe three quarters of a mile before the Mass Pike uh, overpass, before you get to Kenmore Square and the church before. Um, all the signs I've shown you of the Boston Marathon entering each town, uh, entering Wells with a nice big, beautiful silver sign. The only sign, unless they change it, that tells you you're in Boston is this that says Boston Line. Which is actually parallel to the street because I think face St. Mary's is a sign that faces the line. So the namesake of the marathon, because they only get Boston proper for about now. Um, this is the Boston Town line. Again, unless they put a, a new sign, this is it. It's the only sign that tells you you're in Boston. We know, but if you're from out of state or from a different country, you don't know you're in Boston until you get to the finish. But this is it. <laughs> Why you're on Bacon Street. Um, the 23 years I ran this, I, I, I couldn't. I didn't see the sign. I either missed it or remembered it too late because by the time you get to that church right before the overpass, you're beyond this. Um, I had to drive to get this full photo for the book. <laughs> but I always wanted to see this as I was running. Um, one year, I think it was 1899, the winter, there was cobblestones on the ground at the town lying here. And he was the leader and he tripped over cobblestones and just slammed them to the ground. He ended up winning, but he had bloody knees and stuff. So that was his love of the book. So fortunately, it's not called one anymore. Oh, there are still some floating around the city. This is Kenmore Square. We're getting closer to the finish here. Uh, this is the 100th marathon. You have Ronald McDonald and all the other children doing over here. Um, the bus station is a little different now. They have an overhang. They kind of reconfigured that whole area. There's the bridge. The old pass it has the Boston Strong uh, sign on it now. Um, Rosie would have had to come out of a different area uh, in 1980 when Jack Garrow won it. Um, but this is one mile to go, painted here, just off the photo, was a painted that says one mile to go. And I tell people, unless your leg's falling off, you're going you're gonna to make it. It's going to be one of the best miles you've ever run. You know, your whole life, I mean, your whole year, you've changed your life, you've irritated your spouse, you forgot to pick up your kids, whatever you did. It's culminating this last mile. So it's, if you get the banners here, you have uh, spectators always here. It's amazing. Huh? I was joking with somebody, I don't know if they go in shifts and they go in and out of the bars all day. Because when it started at noon, um, I forget when they close off these streets, but once you're there, you're there. And now with the start between 9 and 11 30, with all these staggered starts, they're here even longer. So you go in and out of the bars and cheering you on. It's, they're always there. That one, and it's taking me a long time sometimes. They will be there to cheer you on. You will not be alone, which is great to have. Um, and this is a famous stretch of Boylston Street, which is great because you have all these flags lined up. You'll see the finish line in front of you once you take the turn off at Hereford Street. The cheers bounce off the building really loud. Uh, it, it's, just, it's one of these moments that you just don't want to end. Um, it's a love hate stretch of the course. Uh, you, know, you know what I mean? If you, if you run the dichotomy of emotion, because, like I said, you've interrupted your life for however many months or even a year to qualify, to raise money, to train, uh, all the things you've done, run, you've run through lunch, you've done everything, you've gone to a bunch of road races, all the sacrifices you've made 
for this to absorb all the support. Uh, you're very emotional. You know, you can be vulnerable at times, just being so open and honest and emotional for this final stretch. However, you learn 26 miles, you want to stop. <laughs> so it's a tough stretch. You want this to last forever, but you want to stop. <laughs> so it's kind of a tough stretch. That's why you'll see people crying and emotional because it is a very emotional finish. Once you cross the finish line here, because uh, you can see the church tower from the beginning of the, uh, of the street where you turn off of Hereford Street and you run down Boyle Street right down here. So once you cross the finish line, you go through this mass of people here, you get your bib number, you get some food, you get some water, and not your bib number, your metal, you get your Mylar blanket, you get all these things um, after the finish line. Um, and the finish line itself, David McGillivy always jokes that he is pretty sure he's the only race that paints the finish line after the marathon. And it's true. The other reason he paints this is uh, for tourism, people that take pictures throughout the year of the finish line. So the finish itself is this big latex finish line that they roll out. Uh, most marathons do this now. Uh, granted, back in the old days, it was just a painted line or just the word finish. But as running got greater and greater, the so too did the finish line itself with all the stenciling. Um, the early latex was kind of slippery. Wasn't as forgiving. I remember one year when Robert Cherry got won Boston a couple of times, a number of times. One year he ran, he won Chicago, and he, Chicago Marathon had a big finish like this, and he slipped on it and fell back and got a concussion because the, the sweat and the mist made it really slippery, which was dangerous. Um, but now they're a little more porous, they have a little more you know, give to it, so it's not as dangerous. But the early ones were slick. And also the word is backwards because when runners come from the right to the left, there's photographers up here to take a picture. Because a lot of runners wonder why when they cross the finish line, I can't read the word finish. They go on when the photographers take pictures of you to give you the proof. You look at it, you'll be able to read the word finish and you. <laughs> so that's why the word finish is like that um, for the uh, actual placement of it. Um, and this is the family area. This is done, this is 1996 where Several blocks were needed for all the runners to accommodate 38,000. But for the family the finish area, you get your uh, luggage, whatever baggage that you had in the bus, you get your minor blanket. It's just this is what it is after the finish line area. This is close to the college mission here that it took it. Uh, years now, they ended our own street. They don't go this far, but you need this one to roll to the 100. But it just shows you how many people. And that's kind of blinding too. You see that silver reflected off the sun. <laughs> Um, I will close with this photo. I took this photo from the top of the uh, top floors of the John Hancock Tower overlooking Boylston Street. Uh, here's the finish line. Here's the Boston Public Library, give you some landmarks. So here's Boylston Street. Here's Hereford Street. Here's the fire station. So you come up Hereford Street, you turn on to Boylston, and you run down here, and there's the finish line. Um, decades ago, this is Newberry Street, and this is Commonwealth Avenue. Decades ago, the runners would go Commonwealth Avenue and then come down Exeter Street and finish down here. This is where the first two years the Irvington uh, Street Oval was that the VA games would culminate. Uh, it's no longer here, but that's where they would do it. Then the VA clubhouse that was made was down here as well on Exeter. This is Exeter Street here. So all those old black and white photos that we see at the finish of uh, Johnny Kelly's and everybody, that you see the Lennox. If you look at the photo, the Lennox is on the left. This is the Lennox Hotel right here. Um, the finish line was right about here. So those were the finish line for all those old photos. From 1965 to 1985, the runners would come down Boylston Street and then get off Boylston Street. And there's a road here called Ring Road, which is actually this road here, but it extended here. And the finish line would be right about here in front of the Prudential Building. That's the finish line of all the Philip Rogers wins. Joe Bullock like Samuelson wins, Bob Paul wheelchair athlete wins, um, all the wins that they say our, our generation knows. 1965 to 85, it finished right here in this cement patio area that's what it looks like now in front of the financial building. Um, in late 1985, when the BA finally figured out we need sponsorship money, let's, let's, let's get this marathon to the next level. Um, John Hancock said, All right, we'll give you a zillion dollars for the next 10 year deal. But you gotta do one thing for us. They said, uh, 
before you cash it, what? They said, we don't want the finish line in front of our competitor, credential, move the finish line. So the VA goes, okay. <laughs> so they moved it down here, which is close to the John Hancock house, uh, which means they had to adjust the starting line. So Hawkington had a few adjusted starting lines. Um, when I told you initially from 65 to 85, the starting line was about eight row, that side street of Hawkington, common. Well, the reason it moved to Main Street was to accommodate the change of the starting line from the ring road area here to here. So they had to adjust it. And there's other adjustments along the way in the 50s. And for those of you who have run or even driven over that mass, you said you, I mean, the, the mass pipe uh, overpass to get to Camelot Square, that little bridge. Well, it used to be on more of an angle. So what the city did one year in the 50s is they straightened out the bridge, which is similar to what it is now. So when you drive over the overpass of Mass Pike to get to Kenmore Square, it's a nice smooth straightaway. But by doing that, they shortened the course. And it took a few years for the BA to figure out that we should have remeasured it because the city didn't tell the BA, you know, it didn't happen, they didn't do it from that. But by straight, you know, straightening out that overpass, they shortened the course. So after a few years of the BA finding court, uh, time to get really better, they remeasured the course and figured it out that's what happened. So this has been adjusted a couple of times, but um, not too much. But this is that stretch from Hereford Street to the finish line um, that every runner trains all that time for um, to hopefully feel good because you want to feel good with it. So that's the presentation of uh, the Boston Marathon, some, some of its history. There's much more, obviously, um, but it's, it's a little bit all those photos are in both of my books. So if you want to purchase any of them, you can go to multiplerecy.com on the books. I can sign it for you and send it to you, um, cash a check uh, for that. But if, uh, any, I don't think there's any questions we were talking before. Um, but if there's no questions, though, um, I appreciate everyone coming out, everyone tuning in. I hope this is the first of many more talks. Uh, Zoom hybrid and in person because we need them back. Um, so I thank you and good luck to all the runners of the Boston Marathon as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you everyone for coming.